Hi, welcome to Salon Talks. My name is Melanie McFarlane, and today I'm joined by Penn Badgley, star of You. On You, Penn plays Joe Goldberg. Thank you so much for joining us today, Penn. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's talk about the new season. Every single season of You, uh, Joe moves to a different city. He has moved from New York to Los Angeles to a California suburb and now London. Can you talk a little bit about what London offers Joe in terms of his idea of getting a fresh start? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it offers him as real of an opportunity as he could have to truly get a fresh start, uh, given that many other places he'd have to learn how to speak another language, you know. Um, he's he's in the place that originated the the the, the fantasy world of literature that he that he hides in, that he's created, you know, his entire life as like a protection from the ways he was, you know, traumatized early in life. So it really is uh, as as much of an opportunity as he's going to get. But of course, he discovers that, uh, what is the tagline for this? Like, wherever you go, there you are. I mean, that is, you know, <laughs> it's still, it, he's still Joe. He's still mm -hmm. Joe. Mm -hmm. Now, London's so interesting because it has these different kind of strata in terms of how people receive each other. You know, there's this high, whole idea of if you're an American there, there's a lot that relies on how you speak. Um, yeah. And so Joe comes in as a professor, Jonathan Moore, but immediately when he meets people, they size him up by his clothing, by the way he talks, the fact that he is um, a professor of literature just has very little to, it, it does very little to impress them. Um, and I'm kind of curious to know in terms of building this character and, and how the season goes, how much of like the class differences kind of played into how you present Joe this season? So he has always thought about class a lot, even as the people that he surrounds himself with and despises and eventually murders a few of, uh, they might not think about it because they're usually upper class. So in a way, it, it's it's just magnifying the pattern that's already been there where London, well, England as a country, it's not that class isn't a thing in America, of course it is, but 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 it's, it's, it is different, you know? It is, and being that I'm American, I'm not the best at, at, at dressing down British culture, but but even just moving there myself, I noticed like how, just how different it is and how, everybody can tell where everybody's from even just by the way they speak and they speak of like a, a different neighborhoods as though they're miles and miles and miles apart and it's like bro that's 15 minutes away that's uh you've never been there really <laughs> you know like it's just to a foreigner it was a bit surprising mm. how are you feeling about playing this character four seasons in you know i mean I stay pretty consistent, kind of to your last question as well. Like, like I don't ever approach Joe any differently other than I'm always trying to just be honest and spontaneous. You know, even if I end up doing the same thing all the time, like it's, I'm, that's, uh, that's kind of built into the DNA of the character, but I, I'm just always approaching him. Like I have to believe him and I might speak out against him, you know, off camera, but when I'm on camera between action and cut, I just try to approach him as honestly and spontaneously as possible. And so I'm not so much as putting together a character as, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a witness. Joe doesn't speak that much on camera. It's hard to realize. For instance, the trailer that came out this year, I say one thing. I have one line <laughs> and half of it is off camera. And then the rest of it is just narration and Joe watching and bearing witness, you know, and struggling and in, you know, becoming increasingly desperate. So I do just a lot of like watching and it's interesting because that can, that can, that can remain very, very fresh. Uh, and then everything around Joe is what changes a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm sure people are going to be curious about, curious about this, but when you're there, like you said, you're not saying much, but as a viewer, we're hearing this very rich interior dialogue with himself, with the, you know, unspoken you, whoever that is. Um, how exactly is that executed? Just for, you know, for people. Yeah, so, I mean, so, so usually I go in anywhere from like two days to two weeks before we shoot the episode, depending on our schedule. Uh, and I just, I, I've usually read the script at this point, I can go in and have read the script once before, maybe twice, um, usually in the table read if not another time before. And I can I can bang the voiceover out because I don't 
need to memorize lines. Uh, it's 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 a very like again spont spontaneity is like my sort of catchphrase. Again, I don't know that it <laughs> I don't know that it's always spontaneous in the way that it appears to the viewer, but um, I can do it a million different ways. I don't have to worry about it because it's all right there on the page. I just I just I, I take off my shoes and I dim the lights and I'm in a vocal booth. There's no one there with me and the engineer behind a glass and our post producer online, like thousands of miles away. And I just go, you know, and it's it's really liberating, actually. And it's for me, it's a very different. Um, it's it's 100 percent different from playing Joe on camera where I don't speak. I have to be very rigid often and very tense and communicating everything without words. They feel like just two separate roles. And I don't do a lot of conscious. Um, intermingling of them, the, the ways that it works together is just sort of it's always like a like a happy, magical accident in a way. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the difference between a, an audiobook, it sounds like, and kind of reading that out and doing that. Actually, uh, given that there's such different experiences in a way, it's that is kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this series is so wonderful about capturing the literary point of view. Um, and specifically doing that through Joe kind of skews how we see everything, um, which it seems that that has impacted the way that people interpret Joe, since Joe, of course, is the hero of this story, right? Um, and we're watching this from him, you know, kind of rationalizing why he has to kill people and why he does the thing he does. I'm wondering if now that we're four seasons in, you know, in the, in the first season, you had people online kind of reacting, really gushing over Joe, and you actually kind of came in and interacted with a few folks. Do you feel like people now have kind of gotten past that um, and they kind of see this literary paradigm that that's being enacted in the show and understand like that's part of the trick of it? I mean, I think it's both. I think there's always going to be the lowest common denominator where, you know, there, there are people who uh, are going to think about Joe more literally on his terms mm -hmm. just because that's the way they're engaging with the story. And, and okay, so, so there's that. But I do think the conversation around the show has continually been i don't know like lifted up um and and uh it, i think you're right it's 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 a the whole show is like a literary device or conceit it's all like an allegory to be exploring the way we view love the way we think about love it's taking the archetypes and tropes of our most popular love stories from the last 50 or 100 years and following them to a certain logical conclusion that's Joe. You know, it really, it really is. If if you approach love like a contest to be won, which in a capitalist society is actually exceedingly common, then you know it, this this bears some semblance. You know, there's 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 something relevant here with with Joe. So yeah, and I think at the same time, it's just like it's a it's it's not all social commentary. It's um, it is fun. It is storytelling. Yeah. It's it's a it's a little bit of everything, I think. I am going to return to one part of the social commentary that we addressed in terms of what it means for Joe to be in London. Um, right now, there are a number of stories that are seen as this kind of um, idea of not to give any away the eat the rich stories. We have the menu that came out. We have glass onion. Um, they're seen as these critiques of the hyper rich in society, and you know this idea that they not only think less of people that don't have their money, but also don't really see them as, as fully human as they are, or fully worthy. Um, each of the various circles that Joe insinuates himself into throughout this series seems to escalate in levels of wealth and power. And with this season, it's, you know, we're, we're on an international level, obviously. So I'm wondering what it is that you think that the series and the writers are saying about wealth and the wealthy and what makes them such perfect targets for Joe? That is a good question. And I'll see if I can answer it. <laughs> what is the show saying about wealth? Well, I don't, you know, being that the show is first and foremost about love as a, as a misunderstood concept and phenomenon, that's always what it's saying the most about and the most in, 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 incisive and insightful things about. Yes, there's this aspect of privilege and 
and and class and wealth and power that we're this season more directly addressing than ever. And if I I don't have enough perspective from it right now to to be able, but I feel like it it is just towing that line which we know like you know ch- chances are statistically the more the more wealth and power uh, you come into the more miserable it makes you the more suspicious you know it it it, it makes people the more uh, terrified of losing it uh, and therefore the way that just seems to manipulate the world view of people in these power centers you know i mean to me the irony is that like we now, I think, pretty readily have seen from world leader to to international icons, and uh, you know, we know that 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 this kind of power drives people crazy, and that it does not generate happiness. But it is power, and so you know, what is that like? Where does Joe land in all of this? I think Joe, in some ways, he's always mimicking this a bit he's mimicking um morality obviously you know in a way he he's not a moral person but he's very morally concerned so he's sort of like i don't know he's he's towing a a like a populist line even though he himself is technically an elitist if you think about it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you go into that a little bit more? I mean, I, I don't know. I think there's just like J- Joe is a perfect device because you can delve into something, but you always have the the rip the the like the safety cord or the safety net of like yeah, but he's a hypocrite. So if so if the writers or we are all exploring something earnestly, I think, but of course nobody has a perfect perspective. So if there's any place where it's really like got some blind spots, well, that's Joe. Frankly, that's okay. You know, I mean, so in a way, I really like that. It's like we can dig in and not worry about having a perfectly protected stance because at the end of the day, Joe is um, an unreliable narrator and a despicable human being. So, you know, just because he's thinking it and saying it doesn't mean that we think it's right, but he is getting at something. And of course, people can identify with that. So, so to me, Joe is like, he's a many sided die. He's got too many sides. He needs to die. <laughs> That's like a D and D die. It's like twenty yeah. sides, hundred sides. You don't know. So, I want to get into one aspect that you just touched on, which is this idea of he's a very he's very much a romantic in a toxic way, um, and the fact that you know, Carolyn Kepnes wrote the novel as this kind of uh, reaction to these remote romanticized versions of stories and the way that we look at love. Part of that, I think, that manifests that I see among people in the dating world is there's always some of it's a joke and some of it's real. It's the I can fix him kind of model. And we're looking at Joe and he's always, you know, again, trying with that new start, moving to a new place, trying to reset his identity. That's also a part of a strange, I wouldn't quite call it a trend, but for instance, like the Dexter revival, here's another serial killer sociopath who has convinced himself at the least the beginning of the series that he can change and has been able to kind of treat the fact that he is a serial killer as an addiction. What do you think it is? First of all, do you think it's possible for Joe to change? I mean, Joe is not a real character. So, I mean, you could, you don't necessarily have to go into a psych manual, but do you think it's possible for Joe to change? Well, yeah. So, so Joe, Joe, as a converted into a real person, I think I start with the baseline of, I do think change is theoretically possible for everybody because that's the human ability. That's, that's what we're here in this life to do, you know, is to grow and learn. Um, so of course anyone can change, but then you have to think, well, you know, what has this person then really done? What are they responsible for? What would it require? What, what, what would change then require, you know, if you've done, things that Joe has done, change would mean reconciling in yourself that you have murdered like more people than you can count Mm -hmm. readily. You know, it's like, it's like, oh oh, yeah, there's the guy in the, yeah. Oh yeah. I forgot about him. Like if you're really there, I think what would require your reconciliation, let alone that with, you know, any kind of judgment in society is 
more than you've indicated at this point you're capable of because you've done those things. Somebody else might be capable of that, but they've not done those things, you know? So it's like, it's a, to me, it's a catch-22 if you're going to talk about it in real terms. And yeah, I, but to be clear, I don't, I think it's important to, 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 to me, like, the show is never a clinical portrait of either a serial killer or a man with like, um, you know, mental illness. So, so, so the fun that we're able to have when we do all of this is like, this is not meant to be real. It's, it's, and to me, that doesn't take anything away from it. It's, it's meant to be an exploration, you know, an exercise. There's an element of fantasy and camp to it that lets us do a lot of things. And I think, again, I, I think we benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And the reason I asked that question originally is that I think that there's this idea that is compelling both in television, but also in terms of the, the, our romantic vision of love is the ability for love to repair that which seems to be, you know, irrevocably broken. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of going back to the way that people interpret Joe, what do you think that that his kind of everything that he does each season, you know, what do you think that that's kind of saying about love in general and how we interpret love? Well, I think it's more about how we interpret love. Mm. I think love is a... Let me go ahead and talk about love. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that when we are tapping into it, we're capable of, of things that we didn't imagine. However, the question is, when are we really tapping into it? Or when are we tapping into something? Because like the love between two people romantically is, is only one kind. And it, often it's very narrow compared to the sort of love that it takes to transform the world to forgive, um, you know, someone who's betrayed you who again not a romantic betrayal like you know the, the 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 discipline that it takes to raise a child like that sort of love like genuine discipline and not authoritarianism you know it's like there are so many forms of love that the world is a stage for and the kind of love we talk about in stories in hollywood is like such a small part of that and that's what this is about this is like when we talk about love, we're talking about really often a different four letter word, you know, as pop music has <laughs> abundantly shown us quite literally, you know, that just using those two words interchangeably. And I think like this idea of love and then also redemption is at the core of this show. There's this question like, is Joe redeemable? But that question of like, is anyone redeemable? Who gets to be the judge of that? That really is like a God level decision. That's a, that's a, that sort of God level vision. If what, what makes any of us think that, that we have the right to, to discern, to define whether or not someone is redeemable, depending on what they've done, according to our bias and subjective view. And so I just think more and more the show is, is, is sort of checking us and making sure that we remember when we think we're talking about love, we're often talking about something that's more like objectification and obsession. It feels good because it's like a drug, you know, when you first meet or see somebody that suddenly just really grabs you. But, you know, again, that's not ever, that's not what sustains a relationship past even like, you know, very early on. But we only usually see relationships in, in, in Hollywood type stories in the very beginning or the very end, never the in-between. <laughs> the in-between is a montage. That's what it is. At best, we get a montage, you know? It's like, let's skip over many years with some music. That's the kind of attention we're gonna pay to the real stuff of relationship and love. Now let's talk about the explosive beginning or the explosive end. And it doesn't teach us that much. I think we've learned those lessons. We need to learn more about the middle. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to draw all of this back to your podcast, because I find it's very interesting that uh, Pod Crushed is all about stories of middle school horror. And I think that's the part of life where people begin to watch, they begin to interact with these books, these movies, all of those kinds of things. But what fascinates you about that time of life? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, I was uh, not really in. I, 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 I had about half of my middle school career. I, I didn't finish seventh grade. Uh, 
and then I moved to LA and started working as an actor. So maybe part of it, I've looked at this enough that it's there, but I'm not, it's not that compelling to me. Like I was sort of frozen in time there, not me, but maybe my, my academic career. So like my relationship to school, the experience I have doesn't really go beyond 12 years old that much. So, you know, high school, I actually experienced for a few weeks, but, um, so yeah, uh, there's that, but to me, this period of roughly like, let's call it like 11 to 15, something like that, this adolescence, this coming of age. I mean, it's a unique period in life. Not only are we developing like bodily powers, you know, going through puberty and stuff and discovering sex, but, but actually we're discovering the world of like virtues, like, you know, what is justice when you're six, when you're 10 and then when you're 12, when you're 12, you can really think about something like, like, like justice. That's, that's, that's pretty deep. That's different. That's see, I think it's deeper than sex, you know, but that's kind of all we talk about when we talk about that, that, that the change we're going through. It's not just that. So, you know, you're becoming like, um, who you're going to be. And the encouragement you do or don't get in that time is huge, you know, cause that's all, that's, that's what people want then. But what does it take to encourage a 12 year old or a 13 year old? You can't just say like one of the questions we ask at the end of every episode to our guests is, if you go back to your, to your 12 year old self, what would you say? And usually it's some version of like, it's going to be okay. And everybody usually has also a pretty unique and beautiful answer that has these variations to it. But I think the thread of it is, is, is something of comfort. It's providing genuine comfort that actually relieves the, the, the awkward 12 year old of the, the pain they're feeling of not fitting in and just the extreme self-consciousness. But the truth is, in order for them to get that relief, they have to believe you, you know, they have to, they have to trust you, they have to know you, they really have to love you, you know, or something along those lines, you have to love them, I think, and they have to feel it. So it's not that necessarily, it's easy to talk about, but not that easy to practice. And I think that's maybe what we're, we're, uh, we're doing, we're, we're thinking about it and hoping to put it into practice too. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting co podcast. I've been enjoying listening to it. Um, and I need to let you go. But before I let you go, by the time people see us talking, the first half of you's fourth season is going to be out, the first five episodes, and people will be digesting it. So what would you want to tell someone <laughs> knowing that, that they're seeing the first half of Joe's latest chapter? Well, I mean, part two really goes to a different place. I think um, part one, you know, you're it's 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 in a way it's like it's a necessary I, I don't want to give too much away like but it's it's a necessary turn to really bring it home in a new way and i i think like as of episode eight of part two uh so just a few more episodes in the show discovers something new about itself and is really special which i love but i can't say anything more I'm looking forward to it. So thank you so much. This was such a thoughtful conversation. Thank you.